and this is going to seem very similar, but we're also going to talk about chi-square. All right, so correspondence analysis, uh, we're going to go back and start and keep talking about categories and um, sort of expand what we can do with categories. So I've loaded up all my Python stuff here, and the uh, Python package for this section is called prints. And so we are now moving on to here. <clears throat> so a reminder, this Berlin and K theory, which we covered in the first week, is about sort of a linguistic interpretation of color. Mainly that color vocabulary kind of falls into these, these, these color groupings. And what we can see with these color groupings is that, um, you know, we find these differences across different types of text where people use color words differently. Okay. And this uh, is kind of the basic gist of a, a stylistics analysis. So trying to understand the different ways that people write given different texts. <clears throat> so the full data set, which we haven't played with before too much, is from the, contemporary, the Corpus of Contemporary American English. Um, and all it has is that adjective use of color terms. And what we talked about last time when we looked at this was that the ish, main issue was the size of each of these registers. So it was very difficult to compare spoken versus press because the press category was just much larger. So we talked about uh, deviation proportion numbers and looking at variance. Let's expand on our abilities now. And I'm going to talk about chi-square. So if you're familiar with chi-square, you can just tune out for a couple minutes. But I found that when I first started teaching this, uh, talking about mosaic plots, uh, I had so many questions because people had not either seen or remembered chi-square. So uh, chi-square is an analysis that allows us to think about categorical data, frequency counts. And if they are different than we might expect, given the size of the uh, data set. Okay. So I'm going to work with a really simple example here and just look at a 2x2. Two two. Now 2x2 two two chi-squares sometimes act a little funny, but we'll talk about that. Um, <coughs> so you can understand the math. Because correspondence analysis is chi-square on steroids. Okay. So I'm going to work with just black versus blue and spoken and fiction. So the question here is, is that pattern the same? So is the pattern of black across spoken and fiction the same pattern across spoken and fiction for blue? You can do it the other way. Is the pattern for spoken the same in blue and black as it is for fiction? Some people talk about chi-square kind of being categorical correlations. I think that's a misnomer. You can calculate what's called a fee coefficient, which kind of mirrors the... the um, structure of a correlation, but I think it's very confusing to say that um, categorical data has correlations because that's just weird, right? Um, instead, what we're thinking about is if, if the patterns of the data are the same given the sizes of the data. And we do that by thinking about the expected values. So expected values are calculated by row total in the real data times column total in the real data divided by total, total sample size. And then you would never really do this by hand. I just did this by hand to show you how it works. Okay. So I calculated the row sums for black and blue, the column sums for spoken and fiction, and then I just did this mathematically. A okay. row times column divided by total, row times column, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and what that does is it gives me an expected value <laughs> So this is what I'm comparing against for my null hypothesis, so to speak. And that expected value is based on the size of what's there. Okay, so notice here in our E scores that it's biased more of our expectation towards blue because, I'm sorry, black, first row, because black is a naturally larger category. Okay. And it's biased them more towards fiction because fiction is the larger category. And so I think what people find confusing here is the calculation of, of E, or the, the comparing it to what we might expect, right? 
you wouldn't expect these to be equally distributed where it's like a 25% of the numbers in each box. Now you might, given your example um, or your data, and you can calculate it that way, but in reality, that's not the way life works sometimes, right? So we just know that the word black is more frequent and the fiction category just has more words in it. So our expected values here are based on the fact that there's more in one row and more in one column than the others. So, uh, okay, so expected values. Well, normally you get your expected values from the chi-square.test function. It's a little bigger. And you can see they match. So if I kind of flip back and forth, you can see that this is 17,430 and this one's 17,430. So that's what that function is doing underneath. Now, if I compare that to the actual data, so here's the estimated data pattern, and here's the actual data pattern. Now I can say, okay, 20,000, is that greater than 17,000 statistically? 44,000, is that greater than uh, 40? I'm sorry, yes, sorry. Is 20,000 greater than 17? Is 41,000 less than 44,000? So it's like, they can't both be greater. And so the chi-square formula is a summation of each observed cell minus each expected cell, so you match them up, squared divided by the expected values. Okay. This is a variation on the formula for standard deviation, where standard deviation is x minus the mean squared divided by n minus one, right? This is effectively that same idea. Um, and since it's squared, all the values are positive and the numbers get real big real fast. So I could take a sum. I am struggle busting with the no mouse tonight. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, a sum of each of the observed values minus the expected values, so the squared, divided by the total, and we get about 2,200. Now the chi-square statistic that's part of chi-square.test will, will be a little different because it's an approximation with a slight cor uh, continuity correction. So the formula has got some other little stuff in the background, which you can turn off, but for most purposes, that continuity correction is a good idea. Um, and so they're pretty close, right? Would that be significantly different from zero? Yeah, <laughs> by a lot. Um, and so what we would say is we this, the pattern of data is not what we might expect given row and column totals. And, but it doesn't really tell me what is different. It's much like an ANOVA. It doesn't tell me where the differences are. Now, there are several things that you could do. You could do a proportion test. So compare just black spoken versus fiction and then blue spoken versus fiction or the other way. Um, but kind of a, a, a cheat that I think is probably more useful, I'm biased here, is that uh, we can use what are called standardized residuals. So standardized residuals are where we calculate the um, sort of uh, z-score difference of how different they are from what we would expect. So they're much like residuals in regression. Now the raw residuals are O minus E divided by the square root of E which is what these are. And so I can tell that these are much larger than expected, these are much lower than expected, and the reverse. Now the standardized residuals, the formula is actually quite tricky, but the, the basic idea of it is O minus E divided by the square root of the variance of the residuals, but it's not literally this formula. It's not, um, the variance of the residuals is calculated in this kind of complex way. Uh, it's not literally just the variance of the four numbers. Um, so this is a little misleading, but the basic idea is it's the square root of the variance of the residuals, which is what a z-score is. z score is a member of x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Well, what's standard deviation? Variance, square rooted. And so that's what this is. Now, in a 2 by 2 in chi-square, you always get this pattern, okay, these kind of nice equal numbers. Now the unstandardized residuals don't, 
But what you'll see is one of them will be positive and one of them will be negative because if one side's positive, the other side has to be less. So if this is more than we would expect, where did that more come from? Well, it had to come from over here or it had to come from down here. So we always get this nice kind of simplistic negative positive pattern. And they all can't be more than you expect because the data's got to move somewhere. Um, as you add more rows and columns, that pattern is not that not that nice. So that's why I said two by twos are kind of interesting because if one cell is greater than you expect, the, another cell has to be less. Um, and that's true in bigger sizes, but it's not always the next one over. So how would I interpret this? I would say that, well, it appears that in the spoken register, um, it's using an earlier color theory, and the fiction register is using a later color theory, because there's more of them. What I can do with that, though, to make it more, to make it visual, because the data viz is like where it's at, right? I can show people these numbers, but I bet you're going to convince your boss more or um, get more clicks. I don't know. Make reviewers happy. Who knows? With a picture. Okay. So a mosaic plot is a visualization of these standardized residuals from chi-square. The box size in a mosaic plot is O. So you got bigger boxes for where more of the data is. The coloring is shaded for um, the strength of the residual and the direction. So it's kind of like a weather map. And we can make a simple two by two one, and then I'll show you the full data set, where we're just doing the raw data here, color register two by two. Uh, label axis style, this makes them perpendicular. Shade equals true, which is what you want to do so you can see the numbers. And then I just gave it a title. Okay. So we can tell right away that black is the larger category because it takes up more of the space, and especially fiction because it's the biggest box. Okay. But even though that is the largest cell size, it's less than we might expect given that it's the biggest one. Okay, that's why it's red. Um, blue here is uh, more than you would expect. So there's more heat in these two offside than you would expect given the size of the category. So let's look at the whole thing. So here's the pattern of data, the um, uh, correspondence here for uh, the whole color register. So what can we start to see here? Well, Let's see. What I can tell is that black is a very common color register, and it does seem to match the theory because the pattern is almost the same as white. So if we remember our chart, black and white should go to, should have a similar pattern. And then no, I'm not remembering. I didn't bring up my mouse. And then red and green and yellow. So let's see here, green and yellow have pretty similar patterns. The difference, they've kind of got this opposite pattern in fiction and press. Orange, pink, and purple, pretty close. Well, actually, no, they're pretty different. So they're less than expected here than spoken fiction. Orange is not really different um, until we get down into press. So orange is more prevalent in press than you might expect given how tall, small it is. But pink and purple match pretty well. So does it support color theory? A little bit, yeah. The, the idea that there are differences definitely supports. All right. Now, I like to talk about chi-square because correspondence analysis is just chi-square on chi-square. So we're still in our categorical data section. And what this allows us to do is take the data Put it into a low dimensional space, meaning one or two, um, usually two, sometimes three dimensions. 
And it's really similar to multidimensional scaling, principal components analysis, and exploratory factor analysis. Now, multidimensional scaling is also a low dimensional space analysis, meaning usually two, maybe three dimensions. And you'll, if you're not quite getting that, you'll see it, you'll see it in a minute. Principal components analysis and factor analysis allow for larger dimensional spaces, ranging from two to up, but generally don't get super big. 10, 10 maybe, you know, it kind of depends on the data. At the end of the semester, we'll do super high dimensional spaces or do vector space models. And so a lot of our analyses are really about building a picture of the data. And we do some prediction here and there. <clears throat> um, but these pictures of the data can help us understand what's going on. But we often have to put those into a space set we can e easily visualize. All right, so for simple correspondence analysis, the library is CA, and it's so easy, CA on a ta frequency table. So the main key takeaway here is that this data is a frequency table with row and column names. Um, if you try to run this on a table, like if you try to run this on raw text, it doesn't, it won't run. So what's in the output here? Oh, I need to change this assignment. Oops, I just had a thought. Change dim disk. Because if I never see dim disk again, I'll show you why in a minute. Okay. So I can take a summary of the output, and I'm going to get this super important part first here, these principal inertias. And then we're going to get some statistics about each of the, the rows and then each of the columns. And these are basically how it's making the plots here. So uh, one dimension, two dimensions, and then it uses these mass and um, uh, other numbers to uh, plot this into a space. So let's talk about inertia first, because that's important. The top part of the table is um, inertia, which is kind of like an eigenvalue. And it, so it measures the amount of variance, um, so not variation, variance, I just got excited with the register variation variance, okay, it's just like regular variance, is accounted for by each dimension, okay, so these are similar to eigenvalues, we'll cover that more when we get to factor analysis, but it's this mathematical representation of how much of the um, of the different color frequency numbers can we account for by building it into a low dimensional space. And what we want to do is represent the data in the fewest dimensions possible. So this is also a good data reduction technique. And we can see that the first two dimensions, it gives you this dimensional value here, but then tells you the amount of variance so the first two dimensions account for approximately 78% and 19%, so 97 total of the data. Okay. That's a lot. So I can tell you a whole lot about what's going on with just two dimensions. Okay. That's very useful. And then if we add that third dimension, we get all of the variants at once. Um, and saw something else. I need to make sure I update these notes for you guys. So I can also use the plot function to really see what's happening. Okay. And so here's dimension one, okay, the regression equation. Here's dimension two. And so what we've got here is a plot of how they're related to these, these essentially regressions. Okay. And the way that it plots these is a chi-square value. So it figures out the middle of the middle here. Can you calm down? Um, it figures out the middle of the middle and then plots how far away they are from the centroid, which is what this is called. It's based on a chi-square of that row and column. Okay, so that's what we talked about chi-square at the beginning. But what can I learn from this plot? Well, I can now look at the relationship between rows and columns, and I can see it's almost like a cluster. Okay, we're going to do um, cluster. We have not done cluster yet, right? We're going to do cluster soon, very soon, maybe next week. Um, 
and talk about actual clustering, but this graph to me may see some really cool pictures that I can say, well, what we see is that black and white color theory, okay, hanging out over here, heavily close to spoken, which is what we saw with chi-square. Okay. Academics kind of out here in left field, like most of us, <laughs> but it's closest to black and white, which makes me amused because most academic writing is considered very dry and boring and sort of black and white, right? Um, we see, hey, hey, none of that. What we see is um, we get some of the later colors clustering here together. Orange is kind of the odd man out, and yellow should be up here and over here. But we have a, maybe a good reason why these turn the way they do. Fiction here is represented by the later color theories, which makes sense because fiction is often thought of as painting a picture for people. And so, how, um, if I, you know, if I'm using these plots, how are they different? Um, they're clearly different than a conventional inference tree, but how are they useful, right? So, uh, the main interpretation is that things are close together. They have similar frequency counts or similar patterns of data. Okay? And that means they have similar profiles. Sometimes this analysis is called behavioral profiling, but that has such a like a name that makes you think of something totally different, right? Like FBI, Mindhunter, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I try not to call it behavioral profiling. Correspondence analysis is much drier. But the idea here is that they have similar profiles. And if their profiles are similar, that means they're very similar things, which means they're probably related to some underlying factor. And those underlying factors are often called latent variables. And we're going to cover latent variables a lot more in the next coming weeks. Uh, for right now, a latent variable is just the underlying reason why these two things are similar. And the distances on the map between all these different things are just different forms of chi-square. Okay, so we carry the center, the average profile, and you just see how far away they are from average um, and plot that out. And so I just printed them again so we could see um, together. So we have pink, purple, orange, and gray. So we have pink, purple, orange, and gray. So they're at least all on the same side. Um, we can tell gray maybe it doesn't follow the pattern. Uh, green and red are kind of an interesting one, but they're close together at least. Yellow should have been over here instead of orange. And some other interesting things kind of looking at this data is we will see here that press, this is just like uh, newspapers, their color register is close to green and red's color register because of the way we talk, right? So political orientation, there's a lot of red versus blue states, that kind of thing, um, and or proper names for things like the Red Cross or the Green Bay Packers. So we're seeing... Um, mm -hmm that influence of culture on our on color theory basically fiction is likely later closer to these later color terms because you know you have to describe you have to make the mental image of what people and things look like and academics and spoken speech appear i say boring but their use of color terms is much more towards other early color theory where black and white is more common all right. You need to go out. You need to go out. Very determined to go see what all the all the business was about. So how do we analyze simple correspondence analysis in Python? Well, I'm going to use the Prince library, and then I just transferred my data over from R, so the R dot color register. And then we, like, this is Python, so the rules in Python, blank model, fit the data. So here's our blank model, prints.ca. Number of components here, two for two dimensions. Uh, iteration three, you can make this any number you want. Don't do one. Uh, the rest of this I would just recommend leaving as default. Then we fit it to the data. Our explained inertia values, so since we picked two, this should give us the exact same numbers as R. These functions are exactly the same. We should get the exact same output. Okay. 
and we do, which is cool. So again, 97% of the variance. Now I can make a pretty plot with matplotlib here. Yeah, cool. Uh, R is much easier to plot. <laughs> but I guess uh, if you are enamored with matplotlib, which I am not, you can um, make the same graph. Now I will say here that this graph is flipped. That doesn't mean anything. Okay. So the, the horizontal flip here does not mean anything. The relationships are all still the same. All right. The other thing I can do is make a 3D plot, which to do that, I will need to come over here and rerun this. Because obviously I cannot print a 3D plot in a PowerPoint slide. So, come on, give me a plot. Is it still running? Thinking real hard. Stop that. Give me the plot. There it goes. It's really slow. All right. Now, I can't do a whole lot with this. If I was actually going to do one of these plots, I'd probably do it in Plotly because I really like the way Plotly does 3D plots and you can manipulate them and you can look at them and stuff. Um, but the cool thing using RGL is you can do this kind of quickly. And they're really nice. So now I can get a better feeling for why these color terms over here are separate by turning the plot. Let's see here. So is gray that different than everybody else? Yeah, it really is. I mean, like, it's pretty far out there. And it's right on the equation line. I can see that white and black, when flattened, are very similar, but in 3D, they do get a separation between them. And spoken is not quite on top of them either. So we do get a little bit of separation over here. And you can see that um, orange actually does fall in line with these other colors. It's just higher up in this dimension. But planar wise, for the third dimension, it's the same. Now these are really neat. Um, hard to display unless you have the ability to print interactive graphics. Okay. So that's where a library like Plotly is really handy. Because it runs on JavaScript underneath? Question mark? I think. Pretty sure. <clears throat> okay. So let's move up, make the data more complicated. <clears throat> okay. Now let's go back to categories, because I love categories. So is there a difference in categories? So I'm going to try to use um, kind of a businessy example. So let's say I'm trying to um, make a tracker for chairs. <laughs> I don't know why you do this, but you know they have those like trackers for for electronics. And mostly people are following the price. But let's say that someone is detailing out all these different chairs, office chairs, lazy boys. Um, work chairs, picnic table chairs, you know, chairs, and you're really fascinated with them. And you wanted to know what kind of label you should give your new chair product. And so you want to understand what people are already doing out there in these labels. Now, what we're going to work with here is, this is Dutch? I don't remember, I don't even remember what language this is. German, okay. Dutch is a different example. Okay. So, is there a difference in these categories? Okay. So, for Stoll or for Cecil, okay. the loose translation in English here is chair and armchair. Okay. What defines those? What makes them? Okay. And and <laughs> it's actually like is a published paper partially, and we're going to use newer data than this. <laughs> they just like gave people pictures of chairs and was like, what is this? I just have people labeling them. Okay. Remember we talked uh, last time about how people use basic level names when you were asked to name something, right? Um, so I'm working on a table. Uh, and kind of just like looked at name frequencies. But what we can do is that we can now see if this analysis still holds by using product listings. Okay. 
And so the main difference appeared in his original analysis, oh my God, 40, 60 years ago, is that chairs were functional and armchairs were comfortable. We'll see if we can recreate that. So the data is coded from IKEA's website and not another um, couple of German uh, online real re retailers by coding their text descriptions into a bunch of different categories. Okay, so notice here we still have completely categorical data. We're going to drop these first couple of columns, but we're going to use these other kind of columns as our text data. So we've got a function here. Is it for eating or for not for eating? For work, what's the, what is the purpose of this chair? How is it a children's chair or an adult chair? What kind of back does it have? Is it soft? Does it have arms? Is it upholstered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Does it swivel? Does it roll? Does it recline? Okay. So we've got all that coded. Let's see what the features are for each of these chairs. So this goes back to checklist theory that we talked about last week. Now that I have more than a variable by variable, so what we've done from moving from a simple correspondence analysis is we have two variables, two completely categorical variables and you got frequency counts. This analysis is called a multiple correspondence analysis where I have more than two variables that are mostly, that are categorical. Okay, so this is chi-square on chi-square on chi-square, chi-square on steroids. So multiple correspondence analysis allows us to look at the multidimensional space of all these variables at once. So to do that in R, we're going to use facto mine R, which is just some really cool plotting. MCA is the function. I dropped the first three columns, that's the shopping, the website, and something else, and the actual label. So you don't want to include the, the, the label here. We're going to use that in a minute to kind of overlay on the data. But right now, we just want to look at its features. Okay, so don't use the category label, just look at the features. Now, the summary here gives us a bunch of cool stuff. And so it gives us actually is labeled eigenvalues. But we can see these are the, the uh, similar to inertia. So it gives me the variance. And these are much smaller. We'll come back to that idea here in a second. And then gives us a bunch of information about its dimensions okay, for the rows and for the columns. Mostly, I'm sorry, for columns. All right. Now, I can throw that into a plot. This plot is not very readable. Okay, because what we can do is color the variable names. That's the most interesting part here, the black one. But we can also look at the indices. The indices are the actual rows here. So we can get rows by columns again. When you have this many, which is cool, it's a lot of data, you it's hard to read. Okay. So the indices here would best represent which type of chair is a work chair. So this whole little cluster right here are good work chairs. Um, and then you can clearly see there's a whole cluster of the data that's somewhere in the middle, right? Because it's not really on top of any of the other variables but it does make this chart very hard to read. So you can turn that off as well. So if you use, instead of call dot um, individual rows, basically do invis equals ind, and that will turn off the row labels. Excuse me. So this is the function I'm gonna tell you to not do in your homework because otherwise it will print out 200 pages of output and we don't have time for that. So I'm gonna change it and take it out of the assignment. Um, but basically what dim disk does is it tells me which variables are the most useful and which specific variable combination is the most useful. So it lists them in reverse R squared order so for the first dimension, it is mostly upholstered items, but I have to know what kind of upholstery. So I would scroll down and look at the highest estimates. Okay, these are not quite in order, but it's not upholstered. So even though upholstery is the first one, don't think that, that means that it's the yes category. It's actually not upholstered chair. 
And let's see here, where's upholstery again? Okay. See how the negative is, the yes is a negative. So it's not upholster. Okay, what's next? Material seat. It's a wood chair or a plastic chair. So I've got it here, wood, plastic. It's not a fabric chair. So I've got not upholstered, wood or plastic. Function here, not specific or eating. Hello, little dog. No, it's okay. I've traded dogs. <laughs> I went from one to the other. Um, sorry, it's like dog distraction day. Wednesday, dog distraction day. All right, so come sit down. All right, <clears throat> not upholstered wood or plastic chairs that are for eating or not specific. What does it sound like? That sounds like a freaking fold-up picnic chair to me, right? Those plastic chairs that you have sitting outside. <laughs> right? And we can keep going, right? So soft, and they are not soft. So these are like those grade school chairs that you use to eat outside. Now we can do that same thing for the second dimension and just scrolls down. So you can see this slide goes on forever because it's a lot of information it gives you. So the next one down is function. Okay, this one, function, 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 work. Well, easy enough, right? Uh, it's the only one. It's not a relaxing chair, it's a work chair. Okay. And then we could do seat depth, normal. Well, that's almost zero here. Um, it's adjustable, so most work chairs are adjustable. And we can keep going. Okay. So what you see if you do the first two dimensions are these like sitting down plastic eating chairs, out lawn chairs, and these um, work chairs. Okay. Now does that line up with the picture? Yeah, a little bit. So if you look over here, uh, swivel, yes. Yeah. So work chairs that are height adjustable, seat adjustable, back adjustable. Over here is where you get these outdoor plastic chairs. And then we actually have this kind of like third separate category, which is still within the two dimensions. But if you read these, these are your lazy boys. So it's a bed, it rocks, it's deep, it's relaxing, it reclines back. So even though we forced things into these two dimensions, what we can see on these plots are the nice separations of actually into almost four little groupings. Okay, I'm not going to call them clusters because we're going to do a different week on cluster analysis. Without, I mean, naturally this makes sense, right? I want, I'm, I'm, one, I have this data, but two, um, I hope this like kind of elucidates, like this is what I would have expected. Now, when you are doing this, maybe let's say on real product listings, I mean, these are real, but, um, you know, electronics, these might work out differently than you would expect. Okay. Um, and so it's nice to have an example that kind of makes sense, right? That it's never, nothing good with this perfect. Okay. So the R squared values on this represent those associations with their dimension. P value is the strength of that association from zero. The category section tells you which one it is. Because these are categorical, that first variable label is not just what, it's not just upholstered. It's not upholstered, so the opposite of upholstered. Um, if that value is positive, it will come up on the right-hand side of the plot, representing that category. If it's negative, I'm sorry, it shows up on the, the left side of the plot, representing not that category. Because this is all categorical data. So positive ones means it's there. Negative ones means it's not there. It's the opposite of this. All right, so my overall interpretation, if I look at my graph, that first dimension seems to split on comfortable chairs versus not. So there's like whole plastic outdoor cheap chair category versus work and, and office chair, um, lazy boys. That second dimension seems to represent more of a functionality or it's a work chair that leans, you know, is adjustable and is for work versus our lazy boy chair.
So does that match the original analysis versus our, uh, armchair versus chair? Kind of, right? So if I back up here to new slide, okay, Gipper's original study said that there was like a functional chair and a comfortable chair. So if I think about the work versus lazy boy split, yeah, that seems to match. But what all we've done so far is look at the frequency, the, the variables themselves. How does that actually relate to the original category name? And so let's see. All right. Uh, the third dimension, if we analyzed it, is a bit confusing, honestly. But what we tend to see if we look at the plot is kind of these three different groupings. Comfortable lazy boy type chairs, adjustable chairs for work, um, like an office chair, and then these multifunctional like fold up kitchen table kind of chairs. Now, uh, where I was going with this, was let's put the label on top of that so we can see better how these category, uh, these, these variables map to the label that the online marketplace gives it because maybe the label is not specific enough. Maybe we should do better keywords. All right, so we did not use the type, the column variable, um, type column in our data set. So let's do it now. Let's add it on as what's called a supplementary variable. So it's not actually part of the analysis. It's not part of the chi-square part, but it gets mapped onto it in a similar way. And the way you do that is use this quality sup variable and put in a number. So I dropped columns one and two. Columns one and two were the uh, name of the marketplace and something else. So the supplemental column is now number one, which is the, the it says like label, I think. And so we made a separate model now with that supplemental variable. And let's look at the plot here. Okay, so I've got a plot of the data. Uh, I turned off the row indicators. Um, the column variable ones are dark gray, and the supplemental variables are now black. So let's check it out. This to me is the most telling thing, and this is where I really think um, analysis-wise, if you are interested in like product labeling or um, just trying to understand like how things kind of group together, this is such a, a cool picture because what is happening with the way that they label these as either chair or armchair is that it's capturing those kind of multifunctional kitchen table, plastic seating outdoors, and our, our comfortable big plush chairs, but we got no label here for work or office chairs. And so if you wanted to capture a missing piece of this market, what people are gonna search, if I'm looking for an office chair, I'm not going to search either of these terms, probably. I'm going to search for something that better captures that, so giving it that right label. Right? You are totally missing everything out here. You're kind of missing these two, but mostly this out here. This is clearly three distinct categories. Um, and we only have two labels, so we're missing something. And I think this is what this analysis best provides. All right. So one or a couple little more cool things that you can do. So that prototype stuff, right? Which, which indicator is the best example of our category? And it's considered a prototype in the sense that um, this would be kind of the average of everything in the circle here. And so you'd have to have a way to label the circle numbers, turn on the row labels, um, but what we see is that chair here, so these are the um, these are the variable, yeah, the variable labels themselves, but we could turn on the, the row labels and get the, the numbers out of here. And so it's classified them um, based on, I'm sorry, these are dots here are the actual rows, my fault. I said that wrong. The dots here are the rows. And it is um, labeled them by what their data set label is. And so you see, we do get this like nice, pretty split um, where 
the data set label is kind of cleanly represented, maybe minus these little dudes over here. Um, and if I could, you know, I could add the numbers to this plot, but it gets very hard to read. But basically this little dot right here is the only one that like best represents the middle of this category because we've forgotten the work label over here. Okay. Now for comfortable chairs, we, we have like four or five best, most representative objects. Okay. And that's um, useful to know because you could go up to your boss and be like, these are the most representative chairs. Right. This is chair. <laughs> And that would um, give a useful reference point for comparison. And then you can say, look, nobody's using a label out here. This is what we should, we should do to be different than our competitors. Now, the interpretation here is that this confidence interval um, bar here are these, these prototype intervals or ellipses don't overlap. So we would consider these fairly different prototypes. So the, the, the best representation of the category is pretty different for each one. We could also kind of create this 95% confidence ellipse to see if these overlap at all ever. So it could be that these are two totally different things. So we're comparing apples to oranges, or to not use a weird American phrase, we're comparing computers to chairs for some reason. Right? Um, However, what we see when we do a 95% confidence interval is that they do actually have some, some fuzzy boundaries. They do overlap. And so there's this kind of weird spot in the middle where um, we have some of the features that sh are shared uh, between these two categories. And so the, the items, the actual literal chairs that fall there are sort of halfway between chair and armchair. And so to do that, you just do means equals false versus what we did a minute ago is that that's actually the default means equals true. Okay, so to give you just the middle versus the whole full 95%. So the first one tells me which things are most representative. Okay, the prototypes are distinct and here's, you know, number 47 would be the best. Um, this plot tells me if in general their category has any shared features? And the answer is clearly yes. All right, and there's the plot. So inertia, however, is something that like the math people argue about. And so the way that this function calculates um, the proportion of variance is often criticized for underrepresenting the amount of variance accounted for because of the way the eigenvalues are calculated. So it gives you like a bunch of dimensions. So as many dimensions as there are variables, um, variable combinations. Uh, but in reality, this is meant to be a low dimensional space analysis. And so that's a little biased. And so there's a, an alternative function called MJCA that converts the inertias into what one sees in a simple correspondence analysis. So if I wanted to compare a simple analysis to a multiple analysis, because I have went from two variables to more, you would want to use this version. Because now they have a better map or match to their calculation of inertia. And you can tell, like, this is very different number than the 15% before. And so the first, and we're going to talk about scree plots later, so I'm going to kind of ignore that for right now, but um, the first two dimensions capture 73% of the variance, okay? And then we get another 5% if we add four dimensions, so I don't know if these two are worth it. Um, to add the extra dimensional layer, because in two dimensions I can see pretty clearly, like, here's category one, here's category two, and we're totally missing something up here in this corner. All right, to do a multiple correspondence analysis in Python, you just, you're still using the prints package, so we don't have to switch packages. You just do .mca, and then basically, like, left all of this alone, moved over my chair category, and I dropped some variables I didn't need. So this is the function to eliminate columns in pandas. 
fit the data. And I went back to my uh, explained inertia, so that looks like the MCA function in R. It does not, there's no MJCA in Python that I'm aware of. Okay. It might be in print, but you know we get the same number, so we can say, okay, it's the same analysis. And I can make the same plot. I will say um, here, there's some extra point size, et cetera, et cetera. I will say that um, this is nice because it's colored. It's still not easy to read because we have so many variables and I can't actually see which version of function this is. So there's a function variable out here. Again, again it's flipped, I think, on the axis because here's our work chairs up here. Um, but I can't tell which one it is. It just says function. Okay, well, there's two blue ones over here. Which one is which? Is this work? Is this eat? Is this not specific? What is it? So I think in general the the R plot function has more capabilities um, that are quick and easy. I could do that probably in matplotlib. I just would take many more lines. Okay. Now, to be fair to matplotlib, this is just as many lines as one might use in a ggplot, right? If you're familiar with ggplot. Um, but the embedded plot functions available in the CA and facto mine R packages are pretty, pretty good. So what can I do? I've already talked to kind of about um, this, to me, is an, a, a descriptive analysis that really elucidates what you might be missing or where things kind of group together. I'm being very careful not to use the word cluster here because it's not a cluster analysis. It shares a lot of similarities to what I can do with a cluster analysis, though. Okay. And so what I could do is take these coordinates. Okay, the coordinates here are the ways that it plots these graphs. So it's the relationship of it to that dimension. Now I have the number now. I can use that in my predictive algorithm to give it a category label. So given the um, descriptions that I have, which label should be used for this one? So we could use this in a classification type way. Um, I could also use this to predict other variable sales okay. or um, page views, uh, ratings. So if it turns out that we're not using the right label, the rating might be really low because people are freaking annoyed that they bought this thing and it wasn't what they were expecting. Um, and that I could use an analysis to tell me how good um, these dimensions represent my categories. And what I might find is that for chair it works great, but for work chair it doesn't work so great. So we need a new category name for that. So in summary, we started with simple correspondence analysis and chi-square because chi-square is the foundation for plots in this, and the plots are the important part. And we look back at color terms, because color terms in essence are just a type of categorization, right? And then um, also looked at these category groupings. Okay, you learned how to do simple and multiple correspondence analysis. So you're going to do the same thing in the assignment, where you're going to look at uh, Chinese women names in the simple analysis, and then in the multiple analysis, I've actually forgotten. Uh, some uh, oh some labels for category features in a similar uh, way that we just did. Is that it? Oh, there's not more on this slide. <laughs> there's more on the slide, and you also learned how to do this in R and Python. So the extra bullet point we're missing here, and I would argue that the R functions are still much better. Okay. And as we go throughout the week, the weeks here. I'm going to keep arguing that, and then there's going to be a point where I'm going to be like, JK, Python's much better at this. So what you'll see um, throughout these analyses is I, I personally, a summary here, think that a lot of the ones with some pretty plots, where the plot is the main focus and like, let me see this cool plot, that's much better in R. Okay. Um, so the visualization, uh, the analyses where we're building these high dimensional space models, that you don't really plot very well, you just kind of make lots of numbers, those run better in Python. 
and that shouldn't I don't think be too surprising given the the focuses of each of these languages so that's why it's really important to know both.